This is HighIntensityBusiness.com with Lawrence Neal, helping you achieve your health and fitness goals. Become a great personal trainer and build your high-intensity strength training business. Lawrence Neal here and welcome back to HighIntensityBusiness.com. Today's guest is Bill De Simone. Bill is a personal trainer known for his sensible biomechanics-based approach to the world. Uh, also strength training, sorry, and is the go-to biomechanics expert for some of the best personal trainers in the world, like Dr. Doug McGuff, Skylar Tanner, and Simon Shawcross. Starting as a trainer in 1983 in New York City, in 2006, he opened his own studio, Optimal Exercise, in central New Jersey. He is the author of Congruent Exercise, How to Make Weight Training Easier on Your Joints, and the upcoming Joint Friendly Fitness, your guide to the Optimal Exercise Program. He has presented at national conferences, provided in-services for private studios, and consults online or by phone with individual exercisers. Bill, welcome back to the show. Well, thank you, Lawrence. That's, that sounds pretty good. It sounds like I wrote it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. well, if I, if I had actually read it properly, it would have sounded better. But <laughs> um, I hope that's somewhat up to date, that bio for you. <laughs> um, yeah, I've, t- I've, t- I've tweaked it just a little bit, but that's good enough to start. <laughs> All right, cool. So how have you been anyway? It's been, I don't know exactly how long it's been since we spoke, but it feels like it's been about a year. Yeah, I think so. Um, I think we spoke after I had uh, blown up my shoulder. That's right, yeah. Uh, which was in, it was in 2026, the fall of 2016. And um, then, so I guess it took about a year of, uh, I, I, you know, a year of formal rehab and then another half year getting back to uh normal so to speak um so um so yeah and i think we spoke after that where i elaborated on on misguidedly covering a pool and exploding my own shoulder <laughs> <laughs> so how are you now how are your shoulders now how are you feeling well the uh it's funny i the, the repaired shoulder is um I don't have what I call, I don't have any awkward strength. So, you know, sometimes, so if I, if I, if I go to do something, if I get set, it works fine. But if I just kind of blindly try to push something or pick something up without getting set, I'll, I'll notice a little bit of weakness on that side. But in all fairness, it's not that different from the right shoulder, which wasn't repaired. So it might just be, uh, you know, six-year-old shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> six-year-old shoulders don't don't endure long, or they don't have too much staying power. Right. Fair enough. So, um, but it's been yeah. selfishly, it's been interesting in in how I've had to adjust, you know, my own working out. Um, and so things I suspected before now I know are absolutely true. So, um. I, I and, and, and now, yeah. uh, what's that? Oh yeah, can you elaborate on that? That's, that sounds very really interesting. Well, for instance, um, like pressing overhead, which previously theoretically I thought was potentially problematic, now I know. Oh no, that's problematic. Um, just because the shoulder is a little more sensitive to, like a a technically wrong movement that I could get away with, say through age forty. Now that the shoulder's repaired and it's a little, little, uh, little more, a uh, little more, a uh, little more fragile, and plus I'm 20 years older. Now I know right away, like, okay, this this is not a good move to do. Um, now what's interesting also, though, is that the repaired side might actually even be bigger than the unrepaired side, which I'm not quite sure how that happened. Um, you know, I mean, I did a lot more rehab on that side than on the the intact side, but I wasn't really expecting to see a visual difference. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if that evens out over time. Yeah, I mean, are you are so un, are so unusual? Um, what what, what are you, do you mean in terms of like you've got more muscle mass in the shoulder that was injured than the other shoulder? Is that what you're I, saying? I, I actually think so, yeah. I mean, it's hard to measure. It's obviously, it's just visual. Um, and maybe it's the way I hold it now. You know, maybe I just unconsciously hold it a little bit differently. 
Um, could the body be compensating because of its in because of the injury giving you more? I don't know, kind of cushion and shock absorption around the joint. Could it be something like that? Could be in which something case, we to should that, all just yeah. injure ourselves to get really muscular, right? Uh, if you want to peak in your biceps, <laughs> rupture your biceps, and it'll peak nicely. Yeah, so, <laughs> we don't recommend um, that, by the way. If you yeah, don't get the joke, s- s- semi kidding, <laughs> but um, but actually, you know, you, you know, in a in a bigger view of things, you know, after after age, say forty or fifty. Normal is to lose muscle mass and lose bone density. So if you if you just stay even, you're actually doing pretty well. It's actually quite an accomplishment. So I, I don't. Uh, it'll, it'll be interesting to see. I mean, I think I was last considered myself in really good shape when I did the pictures for congruent exercise, which was seven years ago, seven or eight years ago. So I'm kind of curious to see how how I've changed when I have pictures taken for the new book. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm very curious to see what kind of difference there is. Sure. What, so, what, um, so what have you been up to project-wise? Like, What have you been working on since we last spoke? Well, the big thing that's, that was I added interns at the studio. And um, so since December, I've had um, three interns from the uh, Rutgers Exercise Science Department or, or, or Rutgers exercise science majors. Um, and that, you know, it's funny. I, I first had the idea, I first had the idea around 2014 as I was starting with the joint friendly fitness type book. And I thought that since my, my resources, my research is limited to Google and whatever cheap textbooks I can find on Amazon and, and online, I thought if I had a current student, they'd be able to check what I was doing against what they're currently learning and that they would have access to academic um, search engines. And bureaucracies being what they are, I just wasn't successful in getting them, actually getting an intern uh, sent to the studio um, until just this uh, past December. And then I, I was, imp- and then I had a great response. I had about a dozen people apply. Excellent. So, um, um, so I took two first, and then I took a, a third one over the summer. And it's uh, really been for, for me personally. It's been great because I don't have them just observing. I don't just sit them there and they observe. Um, half the time, it's half the time they do observe or I give them stuff to research, or I give them my stuff to uh, tell me how great it is. So that's, that's good. No, I give them <laughs> my stuff, and I, I give them my stuff to review, but I also tell them, look, if this contradicts what you're, reading, what you're learning in anatomy and biomechanics, tell me, I'll change it. And uh, so far, it seems to have been okay. I, I seem to have... Cool. So far, I ripped off the right stuff. You know, I, I copied <laughs> the stole from the right information. Um, <laughs> But it's also a way for me it's – it's also a way for them to see what I'm doing in the studio without me talking them to death. So I give them a, a flash drive or I give them links to, to the videos and PDFs of the stuff I've written or the PowerPoints I've done. So they can review that on their own time at their own pace and then when they come in the studio for the other half the time, we'll, we can review that and then we can put that into practice. Um, so between that and and another thing that's been very interesting is that even though they they work out the the high intensity style for lack of a better phrase uh, of deliberate repetitions and um you know precise precise working out leading to a high effort that seems to be pretty much invisible it's certainly invisible academically with what they're learning, and even in their in their their recreational exercise, it's like a revelation to them. So, like the first couple of interns, just slowing them down and training strictly, and and feeling their muscles burn was like a revelation to them. It was a shock. Really. Um, and then this third intern, he's a little he's more of a, a little more of a martial arts background, so he's he's 
he he didn't like look at me aghast when his muscles started to burn. He actually lets me push him a little bit. Um, so it's it's interesting in that this is not even this is not even say let's say a Darden type of workout. Like I'm barely I'm not even coming close to pushing him to failure, so to speak. But it's still harder and more deliberate than they've trained before. Um, so to me, it's kind of interesting that it's brand new to them, even if so, though it's something I've lived with for 40, 50 years or so. Um, and I'm, I'm, it's, it's an interesting way of kind of feeding the bottom of getting this information out there. So now when they go to workplaces and they go to train people, you know, they'll be putting it out there fresh. It's not just like limited to our studios and our little, our kind of our, our niche. Yeah. Well, if, if, if they, if it's such a revelation to them, what were they doing before in terms of strength training? Well, um, let me talk about, I'll talk about the third intern, Nick, Nick being a martial artist or being into martial arts as well. Um, Actually, you know, this kind of gets to the the overwhelming glut of exercise information that's out there that is very different than 35, 40 years ago. So 35 or 40 years ago, um, so 70s, early 80s, there was a small body of information. There was like Cooper's aerobic stuff. There was there was uh, uh, Jones and Nautilus and Menser Darden that that. You know, those two scam camps, there was bodybuilding camps. Um, and if you wanted to get into it, there wasn't that much stuff to sort out. You know, you, you would either went the bodybuilding route or the Jones, uh, Jones Darden Menser route or the Cooper aerobics route. But there really wasn't a lot of clutter in the way. And personal training clients back then were paying for access for that information. It started getting some media attention. So if they connected with a trainer, it was to access that information for the client. 30 years later, there's this overwhelming glut of information. And what personal training clients are really paying for is for the, for the trainer to weed out what that client doesn't need to know. So in the case of, 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 of Nick, the third intern, Without the the Nautilus Darden Jones material being prominent in online or in in other media, he was trying you know he was trying kettlebells, he was trying deadlifts, he was trying whatever the Instagram fad of the moment was, and getting banged up doing it. So he was very receptive to my stuff. Um, as far as now, now the two young women who were interns before. You know, I think um, they had some they they had some exposure to conventional health clubs, which again the, the deliberate type of training that we're we're kind of influenced by doesn't really exist in the main mainstream commercial health clubs. And I think while they have you know perfectly fine physiques for women their age. I, I think they were kind of just going through the motions on a machine or on an exercise. You know, I'll do some of these. I'll do some mobility work. I'll do some abs. I'll stretch. I'll lift the weight without any real structure to it. So um, anything goes is a hard – it's a hard thing to sort out. Um, it's, so like I said, for me, to, to, me to, to introduce them to something I've been living with for 40 years – and they see it as very clarifying. That that's a very interesting um, interesting phenomenon. Yeah, that's so cool. Do you get like? Do you see the aha moments as you're kind of talking about this stuff and then demonstrating it in person? Well, yes. In fact, I put I've put little clips of video on Facebook with some of those aha moments. Um, All right. um, there's one of Sabrina doing a chin up, and I've you know you. You can see she's trying to rush through it, and I'm verbally slowing her down. And then when she gets off the machine, the face she makes is – I mean I roared when I saw it on video afterwards. <laughs> and then um, I had Emily doing a wrist roller, 
and she's oh, I saw that one yeah yeah and with the with the the, the primal scream at the end <laughs> <laughs> so um um and then uh, you know so so it, you, you do see that moment where they're they may not be be like technically perfect but it's a big improvement to what they were doing and that sensation of wow this muscle's burning or like that effort was very intense you know what is this um you're right that's very cool and again that's something i've taken for granted for all these years yeah it's very difficult one thing i've found is the more you get into this and the more you learn the more it's the more challenging it is to put yourself in the shoes of someone who is like right at the beginning of their journey or has no idea. Yes. Um, yes. And, and you, I think you probably taught me that ages ago. And I remember Drew Bay said to you once, he said, when I was first getting into this stuff, he said, you know what? You've got an advantage because you're not where I am. <laughs> you're closer to the the beginner and you can kind of bridge the gap a little bit. Uh, but I, I, I do struggle with that. And uh, I've since learn how to better simplify what I'm saying to people so that it's meeting them where they are. Um, and that's proven to yes, work really yes. well. Yeah. Well, that, that's a good phrase. That's right. You have to meet people where they are. If, if you want to, if you want to, um, if you want to connect with them. Yeah. You know, I've seen, I've seen enough bad presentations. Um, you know, it's interesting, especially dealing with college students. Um, if I go to a presentation I recently went to a presentation on crowdfunding and the person giving the presentation, this is a one night, a one night talk. And the person giving the talk was was a college professor. And they presented as if this was day one of a 14 week course that you were a captive audience for. It was awful. Yeah. And I noticed, you know, I I was, I was working up a, um, a chin up video with, with Nick third intern and he sees me tearing the, the sheets up. He goes, what's, what's the problem? I said, ah, oh, that sucks. He said, no, I thought it was pretty good. I said, no, Nick, you're, you're used to being in a class that you know you're going to be there for 14 weeks. And, you know, if, you, if that first presentation, if the first few words of the presentation are boring or if it leaves with the detail and takes 14 weeks to get to the point, that's what you're used to as a student. If we're communicating this on social media, you got to get to the point immediately and yeah. then fill in the detail, um, which, I, which, which we then did, you know, by, by basically reordering everything I had just done. So meeting people where they are, if you, if you want to connect with them and not just show off how much you know, that's the, that's the whole key to communication, especially in the uh, – internet social media habit we've gotten into i also think that um it's kind of a win-win in a way because when you get into health and fitness or if you're trying to become a personal trainer you quickly realize that it is so vast there's so much to learn and you'll you'll always be learning um and it's very intimidating because you go down one rabbit hole of one nuance in fitness and it's enormous, right? In terms of the amount that you can learn and the amount, and it's, it's also quite scary because you realize how much you don't know, right? The more you know, the more you realize you don't know. Um, and when you meet someone who doesn't need to know all the, the um, science and explanation behind why you do what you do and all they want to know is how to do it and why it might benefit them. Um, it's quite liberating because it means that you don't necessarily have to memorize all of the stuff to explain, you know, the, the, the technicalities behind something. That's not to say you shouldn't obviously amass a certain amount of knowledge. You absolutely should. I think as a personal trainer, obviously you want to understand um, – you know, how to avoid injury, how to do exercises correctly, um, you know, the core fundamentals of fitness. But I, I'm just, what I'm trying to say is you don't necessarily have to memorize vast amounts of knowledge beyond that because that's not really going to serve anyone is kind of what I'm picking up on. Yeah. As, as a matter of fact, I would say that's, 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 a, that's a discourager to the client yeah. if you try to – let's put it this way. Because I, I heard in some of your podcasts, you're you're thinking of starting a studio, and I know you're going more of a business direction. Um, the client already assumes that the trainer they're talking to knows more than them about exercise. 
you don't have to prove it. Yeah. What the client wants to know is, is this person going to talk down to me? Is this person going to be rude? Is this person going to be an ass? That they, they just want to know if they can work with you personally. They assume you know. And I've been saying for the 25 years that I've managed trainers or, or, or hired trainers that 51 to 99% of success as a trainer is your interpersonal skills, right? So somebody could be technically awful, and if they've got – if they can connect with people, they're going to do well, at least financially, but that means it's on the trainer. It's the trainer's obligation to know what they're doing because the client yeah. – you know, if the client likes the trainer and they get hurt, the client says, my back went out on me. My shoulder went out on me. But if the client doesn't like the trainer and they get hurt, even if they're not training with the trainer, the client will say, the trainer hurt my back. <laughs> and not every client, but I'm just saying the, the interpersonal skills piece of this is very important, but it's almost invisible. It, it, but the technical part is almost invisible. You as the trainer have to, um, you as a trainer, it's on you to make sure you're not just getting away with something. You're actually coaching it the right way because the client's not going to know the difference unless and until they get hurt. Um, and, and something you said also is along these lines, you know, even though I, I've described myself for a while as hit influence and not a, a hit purist, the, the, um, the context though is if you start with whatever version of hit you like, whether it's Darden or McGuff or, or, or Hutchins or whatever, if you start there as a base – and you have to make adjustments or compromises off that, it's still a manageable amount of information. But the problem today with, with anyone getting an exercise degree or anyone getting certified as a trainer or anyone, God forbid, looking on Instagram for exercise advice is <laughs> everything, anything and everything goes. Good stuff goes, bad stuff goes, absolutely wrong stuff goes. And if the person has a nice enough body and the video shot well enough, it has – you know, people try to copy it. Um, that's tough. I don't know if I, I don't, I don't really know if I was starting as a trainer today, I would definitely steer them towards, well, what I did, what I did with the interns, I steered them towards Darden stuff. And then we adjusted from there because that's a finite amount of information that's, that's useful and usable. And you're not getting overwhelmed with too many different things yeah. that contradict yeah he's his writing's good in that it doesn't it, it's an easy read isn't it and it doesn't feel too overwhelming so i understand why you start there so let's get into talking about um some of these different exercises that we were chatting about on facebook so i reached out to you quite a while ago now um with you know for those that don't know bill is like my remote um physiotherapist slash personal training advisor. <laughs> um, and is always quick to say, this is my, you know, opinion and I've not seen you and it's probably wrong and blah, blah, blah. Um, but all the same, I still really appreciate it. And, um, you know, I had a recent injury with, with basketball and it's, I think it's fairly complex and we can talk about it. It's a shoulder injury. Um, and so I, I, I reached out to you because I, I think I'd, I'd watched your video on YouTube, which is excellent, and I will link to this in the show notes, um, which demonstrates uh, a congruent chin-up. Um, and you talk about the problems with um, the shoulder in certain hand positions. And I kind of reached out to you and said, you know, um, I kind of, I guess I challenged one of the assumptions around, you know, is it important to have a, a can you partially supinate? Can you fully supinate? You know, is it really going to impinge the shoulder? Um, so I figured, you know, we could talk about this, maybe set the scene for people first. Maybe you can just talk about some of the fundamentals for doing a congruent chin up in your eyes. Um, or, or maybe we can address my specific situation. I mean, I don't, I don't mind how you want to, how you want to approach this. Well, t I mean, t t just tell me what, t tell me your specific yeah. situation and, I'll, and, and then I'll tell you if, if chin ups are relevant. <laughs> and then we'll get into a All general right. conversation about the chin up. 
Yeah, yeah, that's that sounds logical. Um, so this is interesting. So firstly, you know, who knows what caused the shoulder injury? I just know that I had um, when I play basketball, right? I I have. I'll obviously attempt to block someone with my right hand. And when I block, I'm rotating at the shoulder joint and swinging my arm. And I also have a bad habit of blocking someone with my, or attempting to block. I don't always successfully block people, obviously. Um, but I'll attempt to block with my right when it would make more sense to block with my left. So maybe there's overuse. And, you know, when I've played basketball since I'm 11, you could perhaps attribute that to an overuse injury. I don't know. However, you know, I'd been doing... Uh, so I, sorry, so I did feel pain in my shoulder during that, during, you know, a basketball match. And then the day after a, uh, an event, a basketball event, I had the pain waking up and it was pretty sore. And it's kind of like, it's kind of come and gone since then. And this was a good like month ago. Uh, however, I've also been doing other things that may have been compromising it, such as doing a chin-up where I've been doing a relatively close grip, so slightly narrower than shoulder width and completely supinated hand position. And after watching your video, I wondered whether I had just aggravated an already, you know, injured shoulder, which I don't even know. I haven't been to a physio. Let's just be clear. I haven't been to a physio. I don't know if it's my, I don't know where it is. I'm not sure if it's my rotator cuff. I'm not sure if it's some other ligament in my shoulder. Um, and, you know, I've kind of gone the route of letting it heal naturally slash occasionally using very slow, safe strength training and not doing anything silly and taking a break from basketball. And it's kind of starting to clear up, but then I do something silly and it kind of comes back a little bit. But, um, yeah, that's the context. So, how, where do you want to go from there? Okay, so this is this is this is this is this is interesting. This is good. <laughs> All right. So, so, um, so basically, when you block a shot in basketball, right, your arm is obviously above your shoulder, right? Mm-hmm. Your arm is overhead, right? Maybe not, maybe not completely. Um, uh, 180 degrees reaching for the for the sky overhead, but it's it's definitely above your shoulder, right? Yeah. So, and now um, I happen to have in front of me the sports injury guidebook, which I just coincidentally have. So, <laughs> and in the section on shoulder impingement, it says if the structures of the shoulder are ineffective in stabilizing the humeral head within the socket during overhead motions, the humeral head might migrate upward out of the socket, causing the impingement. So what that means is, as your arm is above shoulder height, say to block a shot, or to swim overhand, or to throw a baseball overhand, etc., or do a chin-up, if your upper arm moves upwards, in other words, your 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 shoulder come, approaches your ear, that's a particularly unstable position for the shoulder. And so when you block a shot, so now you're in that, you, so now you're in that unstable position and now a force gets applied to it. So there's not a lot of room in the shoulder and when you arm overhead, there's even less room. So what happens is the humerus pinches tendons, ligaments, rotator cuff, bursa between the head of the humerus and the AC joint in the, in the shoulder, or technically the acromion and the AC joint and right. the humerus. So the point being that overhead is inherently a vulnerable position for the shoulder, and when you apply extra force to it, um, it, it's, it creates a scenario where, where this impingement is created and then what happens is it swells inside, which means there's less room in the shoulder. And so the next time you aggravate it, it swells again, meaning there's less room in the shoulder. Eventually, it turns into an itis, a bursitis, a tendonitis, arthritis. And then eventually, over time, over years, you possibly tear your rotator cuff. In the meantime, with, with deterioration leading to more pain, leading to less movement, leading to less movement, causing more pain, leading to less movement. And so it's a vicious, like a downward cycle. So 
the point is the point isn't by the way never move your arms overhead because well that's part of sports um but you know pitchers who pitch repetitively or um you know in your case it's more acute right because when you block a shot that is an acute event that hurts right at the moment but a lot of times this overhead movement stuff, it's not an acute injury. Like your shoulder doesn't explode like mine did or, or yours almost did. Um, it's just more deterioration internally. Yeah, it's not. It's uh, The funny thing is, is if I make contact with a ball, it's probably less painful. It's actually almost like this force of the swinging motion that causes the pain. And then it, it got, it, it's weird. Like when I first started doing it or when it first started becoming apparent, it wasn't pain. It was just discomfort. I just would do it and be yeah. like, like I'd attempt to block someone. I'd swing my arm, you know, I'd swing through the air and miss it. Uh, and I would just think, oh, that's going to go in a minute. Like at some point yeah. that is going to yeah, start yeah. hurting. That's kind of the, the, the alarm signals I was getting. Yeah. Well, cause things are, you know, things are probably, again, not having x-ray vision, but things are probably a bit <laughs> irritated. Okay. And so that every time you, you, you move it, and the irritation rubs on itself, it's going to get a little more irritated. Um, you know, and that's just the nature of a chronic condition. You know, if it doesn't calm down and you re-aggravate it, it gets a little bit worse and so on. Um, so the, the, the overhead, the overhead motion is a really vulnerable position for the shoulder just because there's, there's not a lot of internal room and the reason why chronic things are, are, are problematic is it's not a stabbing injury. Like when I did my rotator cuff, that was rare because I did a specific thing. I felt a specific pop and that was the injury. And in your case, you know, if, if well, let's say you tried to block a dunk, for instance, and your arm is all stretched out like that and now there's a lot of force coming backwards at you, right? You can say, okay, that specifically did it. But if you use too much of a range of motion in, say, a chin-up, that's a little sneakier because you're not going to get that dramatic snap or pop or crack. But it is going to be adding to the wear and tear. And you'll only, know, you'll only know when the pain sets in. And then in hindsight, you'll figure it out. Which is really the, the tough part I have with a lot of my material because people think I'm talking about only acute, immediate injuries – and I'm not. I'm talking about setting yourself up for this chronic, the chronic um, wear and tear or deterioration. Yeah. So let's get let's talk about where chin ups fit in here. So I'm glad you mentioned a grip closer than shoulder width because I think it's obvious if you're using a palms facing you grip on a straight bar, and if your hands are wider than shoulder width apart, there's obvious hand and wrist and, and elbow strain, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and I also know the Arthur Jones Nautilus rendition of the need to supinate your biceps, to supinate your forearms so that your biceps are in a stronger position when you're doing pulling movements, pull downs or chin ups. Um, however, when, when Jones and Nautilus came up with that in the, in the seventies or so, in the context of what, what was being said in the muscle magazines, it, it was it was a good analysis, right? Because at the time, the muscle magazines would, would write things like a wide grip develops the upper upper width of your lats and a close grip develops your lower lats and a medium grip develops your center lats. And that's just myth. That's just, that's, you know, that's just wishful thinking or that's just, that's just reacting to the sensation. So compared to that, bringing up supination of the biceps is, is, a, is a better analysis. But with the advantage of 40 years and a lot easier references to have, it, it, and I don't want people to come to my house with pitchforks and torches, um, you know, Arthur Jones fans <laughs> go on the warpath against me. But what, it, but, that, what that analysis falls a little bit short of, it, it ignores the joints. So. If you're on a straight bar with a palms facing you grip, okay, so he, 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 what I want you to do right now is 
put your elbows and your forearms and your hands together in front of you, sort of like the finished position of a, a peck fly. Okay. <clears throat> and now try to lift your arms overhead. If you're, if you're holding everything together, um, you're going to find some tightness in the shoulders, right? Mm-hmm. I can't see you. Are you trying that right now? <laughs> I, I'm trying it with a massive microphone in my hand. So. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. But, but yes, right, no, well, no I, can, I can do it and I can, I can feel the tightness. Yeah. Okay, so for people at home, what I'm suggesting is in front of you, bend your elbows at 90 degrees, put your hands, your forearms, and your elbows together touching. Okay, and now try to move your arms overhead. And you'll, you'll find within an inch or so of moving your elbows that, that your shoulders get very tight. Okay, that's not muscular. That's the ligaments in your shoulder are binding, okay? And if you want your arms to go overhead, if you want them to go further up than, say, shoulder level, you have to open up your elbows. Technically, you have to internally rotate, and that frees up the binding, and your arms can go overhead. Now, if you were to take a super close grip on a chin-up bar or a pull-down bar that's straight and it's supinated, that that binding in the shoulders still happens. Only now you're you're using your body weight to try to stretch through it. Um, if it, see again, that binding isn't muscular. That's not a fault of how you trained or how your muscles developed. That is the ligaments that hold your shoulders together. So if you continue to sink your body weight through it or try to, you're at some point you're going to stretch those ligaments out, and then it becomes laxity. And that's something you have to correct. That becomes a uh, that becomes a problem. What does laxity and it mean? Won't happen, well, it means they're too stretched out. Right. But it, but it's different from flexible. Flexible implies the muscle is flexible. The muscle can give. Laxity implies that the the ligaments are too stretched out. So the the ligaments being too stretched out is like having a, a the foundation of your house crumble. The muscles can be super strong, but if if they pull on the bones and the ligaments aren't holding the bone in place because they're too stretched out, sure. it doesn't work as well. It's like, it's like having flat feet where the ligaments in your feet are all stretched out. No matter how much you develop the, the muscles below your knees, your feet will continue to be flat. Mm-hmm. So, the, so the problem with this, a, a hard supinated grip, like a, a palms facing a grip on a straight bar is – if you try to, as you lower yourself, you're running right into the, the ligaments binding. Now, the reason why the, um, now I use, in that video, I use the, um, the Nautilus assisted chin machine that I'd gotten from Greg Anderson. And instead of a straight bar, built into it was an easy curl bar. So you're not using a straight um, it's not, you're not fully supinated. You're only, you're partially supinated. And what that partial supination does is it gives your elbows a little more wiggle room so that, um, you can position your elbows so that you bypass that, that binding position mm-hmm. and use more of a range of motion. Um, so well, an alternative to that, though, is you simply don't go down as low as you – as you. The, if you have to use a straight bar with a supinated grip, simply don't go to, say, straight elbows. You know, you're going to have to experiment with the grip to find where you can get some range of motion that doesn't run into the ligament binding and stop short of where the ligaments bind. So you can use that as a litmus test for yourself because like, and you'll probably go into this, I know, and I want you to, certainly want you to elaborate, but you talk about how everyone's um, ball and socket joint in their shoulder is, can be slightly different in terms of the room that the ligaments have. Um, right, and so, right. and so when someone's listening to this and they're thinking, you know, um, or they, the next go to do a chin up and they're, they're trying to find the ideal hand position and range of motion that works best for them. I suppose if they feel a certain amount of tension in their shoulders at the uh, contracted position, or even well, it, would, you know, it would be the it would be the bottom position. Sorry, the bottom position. Then is that yeah. not a litmus test to kind of think? Well, the more tension you feel there, which I think we all can distinguish what that feels like. I hope um, then maybe it'd be a more ideal to move towards a safer hand position. 
than what was causing that? Well, you know, yeah, yes. But part of what's gotten very um, – part of what's gotten very garbled in the the muscle media is that the idea of attaching sensation with a good effect. So – if you don't do that exercise where you, where you touch your forearms together and see where your shoulders bind without a load, if you just think, okay, I'm going to do a chin-up with a full range of motion and a supinated grip, when you feel that tension, you think, oh, okay, this is – that feeling is my lats working or my, you know, my rear deltoids working. And it doesn't really – you know, it doesn't really occur to you that that's the wrong sensation or that's the wrong conclusion. Okay, so, so the context, perhaps, perhaps so don't, the context, don't fool yourself, basically. The context matters. Yeah. You know, if you do leg extensions and your quads burn, yes, it's a quad exercise. But if you do a leg extension and your knees ache, that's a different sensation. And if, if, if the only things you read are where you, when you feel it burning or you feel it aching, you're shaping the muscle or that's proof that the muscle is, you know – working more effectively, then it's easy to confuse the joint strain sensation with effective muscle work as a sensation. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So what I would suggest is if, if you only have a straight bar as your option, okay, somewhere between shoulder width and your hands touching, there's going to be a, ra- uh, there's going to be a, a hand position that you can get more of a range of motion before you feel that binding kicking in. So if that's your option, that's the one to use. And don't let your body weight pull your body. Don't let your body weight um, stretch you out so far that your shoulders are up by your ears, for instance. Yeah. Because now you're now you're running into ligament binding and you're running into the impingement. Yeah, I will just um, say, Bill. Um, I know because I know it can be so hard to describe these things without exercise demonstrations or images, and it can be quite difficult to do on a podcast. So, just so you know, the listeners will all the links to everything you're talking about, the demonstrations from your YouTube channel, will be in the show notes. So, they'll people will be able to actually watch that and listen to you elaborate as well. So, just to give and, you some. And, yeah. and you know what I'll do is I'm gonna I'm doing a, a video with the intern on on the chin ups. Oh, great! So I'll. I'll make those clips accessible to you so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. Cool. So that's if you only have access to a straight bar. If you have access to the easy curl bar, the easy curl handle, where you're partially supinated, that's a good choice. Mm. If you have access to uh, a neutral grip, so your, your palms are facing each other, they're parallel, also a good choice. And if you have access to some kind of rotating handles so that the handles will follow your, your hands and wrists rather than you having to follow the, the, the hard bar, those are also good options as far as um, minimizing the joint strain on, on during the chin-up. Because most places have the parallel handles. I think most, most gyms will provide that. Uh, and that sounds like the safest option. And providing probably the same development for the you know lats and biceps and so on as any other hand grip would. Well, see so now, now, now this gets interesting again here because which grip you use really only determines well determines the joint stress number one, but it really only determines which muscles assist. So, for instance, if you were to use a a palms facing you grip, mm-hmm. either on a straight bar or the easy curl bar. Your biceps are posi- in position to help and your pectorals. Okay. Because if you notice your, your, your elbows, your upper arms are sort of in the pec fly position. And you can test that out by, by training your chest very hard first and then going to the chin up and you'll see how much your, your performance is affected on the close grip chin up by, by exhausting your chest first. If you go wider, if you use the parallel grip, now because your radius crosses over, your biceps really aren't in position to help as much, but your brachial radialis in the forearm is. 
Okay, so you're really not going to lose too much there. And then if you go get wider again to to a um, palms facing away from you grip and shoulder width or wider, um, now your pectorals are so stretched out they really can't help. And again, it's going to be to break your radialis um, over the biceps helping. Now here's the thing. The old Nautilus literature said use the supinated grip because you can use a heavier weight, which will be better for the lats. But I don't think it, it works that way because what happens is that heavier weight is being being handled by the by the assisting muscles. The lats are always going to be the prime mover in any kind of chin up, right? Because the lats are the biggest muscle that uh, the lats are the biggest muscle that creates shoulder extension or drawing your arm back towards your body. So whichever chin up you do, the lats are always going to be the prime mover. Um, the difference in weight that you can handle in all those three variations is due to the number of assisting muscles, not necessarily because it's better for the lats. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. So, so you're saying that when, when you increase the load, a lot of those other muscles are basically being called into play to help assist with that. You're not necessarily recruiting more of the latimus, the latissimus dorsi in that, in that moment. Right. So let's say let's say you can use 150 pounds on a close grip pull down, and then when you try to use the wide grip, 150 pounds is clearly too much, and you have to drop it down to 100 in order for you to do it safely. Mm-hmm. One or the other isn't necessarily better for your lats, but the wide grip you can't. Your biceps and your pectorals can help. As in the close grip, they can help. So. Is one better than the lats or not? You can't really say because the lats are the prime mover and the amount of weight you're using is changing. Um, now, as a trainer, so, so as somebody who's into it, that might be interesting, but where it's useful is if you have a beginner or a very deconditioned person and you go have them do a pull down or a chin up, you would want to start that deconditioned or that beginner with the closer grip, um, the closer grip movement because you're going to be able to handle some weight. If you remove the pectorals and the biceps from the pulling action, you may have to reduce the weight so much that it's very demoralizing, and you know they don't they feel like they're not getting getting anywhere. So if you start with them on the one that uses more muscles, at least they can see some progress to keep them interested and keep them enthused. And then at a certain point when they've built up enough on the, on the, um, the combination exercise, then you can experiment with the variations that require less weight. So I wanted to go back to um, that interesting point you made about the shoulder and maybe well definitely recommend listeners um to watch the video you did on this which will embed um which where you talk about that is it the glenoid um which is attached to the scapula and how the space between the the uh, within the ball and socket joint is different for different individuals and so in some cases there's plenty of room where for well there's more room for ligaments um, so there's less risk of shoulder impingement, and then in other cases there's there's very little room. So it, that's where this this problem starts, and it's quite individual. So do you want to? I don't know if I've answered that correctly, or if you want to elaborate on that. Yeah, right. Well, let's let, we'll we'll strike that comment about the glenoid because frankly I don't have my textbooks in front of me, so I don't I don't recall every every oh, structural little name here. <laughs> but um, so there's a couple of things. So. There's a, um, I think in that, I think in that video, there's a diagram and it's an overhead shot of a shoulder and it shows the, the humerus being the ball and the, the effective socket that it's working in and where it's an individual matter is how much that socket covers the ball. So if it's a, if it's, relatively deep, that person's going to have less mo- room to move before they start hitting an impingement. And if it's relatively shallow, they're going to be able to do things like a press behind the neck or a behind the neck pull down 
without all the complications because they simply internally can move their arm that far before impingements happen. Um, the problem, of course, is we don't have x-rays of our shoulders when we walk into a gym, so you just have to go by observation. And if, you know, if, if you – so pretty much everyone is fairly safe with their elbows – in the so-called scapular plane. So somewhere between somewhere between your upper arms being parallel and your upper arms being straight across, somewhere in there, just about everybody has room to, to, to for the shoulder to function safely. But at the extremes is where it gets very individual. Mm. Cool. Um, and one of the questions I had about the form is at the top of the chin up, you recommend a slight crunch. Do you mean a crunch of the, with the abdominals? What do you mean by that? Well, at the top of a, a chin up, especially with the um, parallel or the closer grip, the, so what happens is the, the lats connect the upper arms to the pelvis. Okay, but the abs connect the ribs to the pelvis, so it's sort of a natural flow as you're pulling with as you're pulling into the top of a chin up for your body to to recruit the abdominals to help or let me put it this way you're not actively helping, but don't prevent don't worry about preventing it like it, it's very unnatural to try to keep your abdominals slack at the top of a chin up. Hence why you swing, you want to swing your legs forward. Most people want to do that when they get close to failure on a chin up. That's right. That's right. Right. That's, that's exactly <laughs> that's right. That's so interesting. Because your, your body is trying to, your mm. body is going to recruit like the, the next closest muscles that approximate what you're trying to do, which in this case would be your abdominals since they're connecting your ribs to your pelvis. Um, so that's right. And, and also where you see it is when people are doing bad sloppy crunches on the floor and their hands are behind their head, and as they're trying to bang out the numbers, their elbows flap forward as they come up because while the abdominals are pulling their ribs towards their pelvis, as they get fatigued, the next closest muscles are the lats pulling your upper arms towards your pelvis. Right. So they so, work in their lats at the end of that. <laughs> well, well, they're trying. They're using their lats to affect <laughs> yeah. the um, crunch. And as a matter of fact, I, I knew knew somebody who had asthma one time, who had really ridiculously developed lats. And what she explained to me was, is when she would try to do sports and the asthma would kick in, and she would rest with her hands on her knees, her lats were trying to help breathe. So her lats were trying to. Um, assist with the breathing as the breathing got harder. Um, so, so the abdominals and the lats, it doesn't appear that they're connected, but there is, there is a, a natural flow there. Um, mm. So uh, I, wouldn't, mm. I wouldn't do a, like a hard crunch at the top of a chin-up, but it's a, natural, it's a natural consequence of being near failure. Um, and I think if you see, for instance, if you see the person all of a sudden now they're really starting to kick their legs forward, you know, like you as the trainer, correct it one time in case that they just lost their train of thought. But if their lats are so fatigued that their body's getting their abdominals involved, the lats are fatigued enough. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. And just going back to what you said there about um, uh, the lady you mentioned who would put her hands on her knees – this is one of those, I don't know whether this is one of those like old wives tales, but um, I was always taught when I was younger um, that after you've exhausted yourself from like an event or run or fill in the blank, it was always better to stand up straight and put your hands behind your head. And the idea being to open your upper body, to open the lungs and enable you to better restore your, to better recover you know, um, acutely. And so, but obviously the body wants you to buckle over forward and put yeah, your hands on right. your knees, right? That's right. <laughs> and I'm thinking, after hearing you say that, I'm thinking the body knows what it's doing, right? So is that one of those old wise cells when actually just listen to what the body wants you to do? Because probably it's recruiting other muscles to help the process along. Yeah, I, I, you know, the standing with your hands over your head, it certainly is a natural feeling, right? 
it's very unnatural because it's hard to do. You have to consciously go and do it. And it's like, it takes discipline. Whereas the buckled over hands on the knees or just lying down on the ground um, well, is far more natural. It, it, yeah. You know, the, with the hands on the knees, what's, what's happening is, is you're, you're trying to exhale, right? So sometimes like with asthma, the yeah. person can't exhale as well. So what the lats are doing is helping pull down to try to exhale. Um, but also, let's face it, there's, a, there's probably a moment of panic where things are going haywire and the body's trying to do anything to relieve you know, the, you know, that, that discomfort. Right. Okay. And I, 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 I try. I try not to bring myself to that point when I work out nowadays. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I don't. I, I. I probably don't get there very often in in high intensity training, but I. I will occasionally get there in basketball. Um, but yeah, I don't do yeah, a lot of events. That that's will, true. That yeah, will. I can see that. Yeah. 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 Um, anything you want to f- add on the chin up in terms of form? One thing I noticed you didn't mention was the starting position. Do you want to just elaborate on that for a moment? You know, um, since, you know, it's funny, starting position, when you have an assisted chin machine, it, you start sort of mid range, right? Cause you, when you, like, I, I don't do body weight chin ups anymore, mainly because of the shoulder surgery. Um, so I only use the assisted chin machine. I'm able to start mid range and then I, I lower myself to where I want to, where, where I want to start. But obviously if you're jumping up to a chinning bar, the conventional way to use a chinning bar, obviously you're going to start with your shoulders up by your ears and you're all stretched out. Um, I think if you just avoid that, that, that fully stretched out position in the course of your set, and if you only start there and only finish there, you're probably going to be okay. Um, I would just suggest against, like, if you're doing a 10 rep set, going in and out of that position on every, every repetition. And I certainly wouldn't bounce out of that position. Um, that's just, that's just, you know, and again, it won't be an acute injury, but that's just adding wear and tear to whatever other wear and tear you brought onto your shoulders. One thing I noticed when watching some of your videos is you don't seem to be so strict and correct from wrong, um, about a very, very, you know, hit like purist, well, I don't even say it's a purist. This is just quite popular and hit a uh, smooth, a very smooth turnaround. Um, it doesn't seem that you're as strict about that because I know it's when going into the top position uh, in a chin up, you will you will kind of reverse direction somewhat faster than I would have expected. Is that because you're not? Con- have I misinterpreted that, or is that because you're just not as concerned about some of the other people in this industry about these kind of like flawlessly smooth turnarounds? At either end of the movement. Um, well, I, th- I think that's, um, I think the concern with the turnaround is that that's what would, they would call a heuristic, which doesn't necessarily apply in each individual, um, case. Mm-hmm. So if you're in an exercise with a lockout, Rather than lock out and pause in the lockout, which is a waste, and just put stress on the joints, yes, the smooth turnaround is appropriate. But in the top of a chin up, you're not locking out at the top of a chin up. Number one, and number two, you're not near. You're you're near the end of the lat's useful range of motion. So there's really no benefit to holding the top position. Now I I don't think I bounce in and out of the top. You don't. But I bounce, slow no. I slow down I slow down a lot when my upper arms are at about a right angle to my shoulders, right? Because that's where the lats are strongest. So if you're going to spend time, you want to spend time where the the muscles can create peak torque, not the minimal torque. Um, you know, so so as a rule of thumb, I remember Mentor writing that you should pause at the top and bottom to make sure you have control, right? But that's a rule of th- that's a rule of thumb that doesn't necessarily apply to every single exercise. Some yeah. of some of which has a lockout. Um, now, if 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 I was going to chart how fast I move in a rep, I slow down where the joint angle for peak muscle torque is not necessarily at the fully stretched or fully contracted position. Um, 
I also, since I did that video, I, I've I've changed my how I do reps now to where I do. I aim to do ten reps in in one minute. So I set my timer for thirty seconds, and at the end of that thirty seconds, I want to be at five. If I'm at four, I know to speed up. If I'm at six, I know to slow down. Um, with the goal to being finishing the ten at around a minute. Um, if I hit, if, if that, you know, and then at the minute I decide either to do another 30 second negative or to do another rep or two at the same deliberate speed. And if I can go on till 90 seconds, then I know it's time to add the weight. Um, I wasn't quite, you know, the, the old, um, advice to like, you know, two seconds up, four seconds down or four seconds, one second pause, four seconds. Uh, that just drove me crazy. Like trying to count the reps of each, the yeah. seconds of each rep. So now I just aim for, like I said, 10 in a minute, um, as a general rule. So that, so I don't get too obsessed with, you know, a pause at the top, pause at the bottom. If I'm doing 10 in a minute, that's um if i'm doing 10 in a minute that's about effective enough and i'm not going to worry about the um um you know each individual uh, uh the number of seconds in each individual location yeah sure um is there anything else you want to add on the chin up or are you all right to move on to the next exercise so uh, like you know what? I believe I believe anything else I add in the chin up, I will make available to you in our video, awesome. in our slides in the video, um, because I really think we've gone into the weeds quite a bit on the chin up, haven't we? <laughs> yeah, it's good though. It's really interesting stuff, um, and I think it's really useful. But um, especially alongside the video content that we talked about, I think uh, gives people a really good understanding as to you know how they should think about chin ups in their own training and with their clients. Um, how are you doing for time, by the way? Um, we're good. We're good. Yeah. yeah we're good. All right. Let's... Just keep me posted, and we can obviously wrap up and maybe do a part two if we don't finish. Um, I think I think your listeners probably have more problem with the time now because they probably <laughs> probably what the hell is this guy babbling about? <laughs> I doubt that. I doubt that, Bill. People love listening to you. So, <laughs> okay. So leg press. This is a interesting topic. Um, how? I mean, again, I was just going to ask if you wanted to just kind of open this one up by talking about your feeling around um, proper biomechanics for leg pressing, um, you know, the types of machines that people should look out for and the things they should avoid. Do you want to start there on this one? Yeah, that's, that's, that's good. Okay. I, um, I especially like the Nautilus Nitro leg press. Um, so whenever I've said or someone is, you know, somewhere online, I said something about preferring leg presses to squats um, but I, I meant specifically the Nautilus nitro leg press because you can adjust the back angle and it has the, the, the curves of the spine are built into the seat back. So on the Nautilus nitro leg press on that specific model, okay, you can, you can open up the back so that you're kind of mimicking the, uh, squat position. And if you prop yourself up or just raise yourself off the bottom seat, you can fill in the gap in your lower back, all right, which is going to help your spine posture hold. On old-fashioned leg presses, like the 45-degree or the really old ones that are vertical and you're lying on your back, <laughs> especially the vertical ones, it's almost impossible to protect the curves in your lower back. And then when you read in the muscle magazines, like, you know, allow your knees to come all the way into your armpits, there's no way you can do that without your pelvis flipping and lo completely losing the curve in your lumbar spine, um, which is the textbook definition of loading the spine in flexion, which you're supposed to avoid. So do you want so, to just touch on why that's, uh, uh, why that's dangerous? So the the... The normal curves in your back, with the normal curves in your back, the pressure on the discs is even because the shape of the individual vertebrae, they're not like Legos, they're not perfectly um, cubic or, or round, or uh, excuse me, 
The, the, the vertebrae aren't perfectly squared off. They're irregularly shaped so that when they're stacked on top of each other, the curves re result. And in those curves, the pressure on the discs is even. It's flat. When you come out of the curves in your lower back, now the vertebrae tilt, and that's where you pinch the nerve on one side and you herniate the nerve on the other side. Right. Now, your back allows that, okay, because without that, you wouldn't be able to move, number one, um, or you wouldn't be able to turn or twist or, or, or look, look up or bend over. Um, but if you put extra load, like a barbell or a weight or a kettlebell, now you're putting the disc in that vulnerable position with extra force and extra reps. Um, so if you work out in a mirror, you can keep an eye on your posture. But so for instance, something like that, that upside down leg press where you can't really see your lower back, you know, first of all, it's just physically impossible to, to let the weight descend so far that your knees are in your armpits without losing the curve in your lower back, but you're not aware of it because you can't see it. Um, so especially if you're doing a leg press because you want to save your back from the, the stress of doing a barbell squat, you've just defeated the purpose. Um, now, even on the nitro leg press, if you have the seat up vertically like 90 degrees and your seat is too close to the platform, now your knees are going to be driven into your armpits and you're, you're going to lose a curve in your lower back. And, you know, you gave back whatever – Whatever back safety guideline you were you were trying to observe, you just gave away. Um, now I don't know what other manufacturers are doing. I don't know if other manufacturers are building the curve into the seat back. Um, I know some build the reverse curve, which I, I do not understand. Um, um, so, you know. Absent, and, uh, you know, I guess, and I guess if you, if you have a, a leg press with a flat back, you can always put a towel under your lower back to help support the curve or a lumbar cushion. Um, again, probably not the type of thing that would be a stabbing injury, but at some point, if your lower back hurts and if you've been allowing a leg press to push your knees up into your armpits, that would be a place to look at to, to try to correct it. Am I right in saying that you're not a big fan of the MedEx leg press? In fairness, I haven't worked on it. But if what I describe matches that, well, let the chips fall where they may. <laughs> <laughs> well, because it, it was, it was certainly, it's certainly quite a controversial thing to say because uh, a lot of people love the MedEx leg press. You know, I personally like using it. Um, now, I haven't used uh, actually, it. Actually, hold on, hold on a second. Uh, see, I would disagree that what I said okay. is controversial. Any manufacturer that builds into their machine something that contradicts a back safety guideline or that contradicts conventional wisdom for the joints, that's the controversial act. Yeah. Do you follow what I'm saying? I, I like do. If you, look at, if you look at any institution's back safety guidelines, whether you're talking about um, the government, medical groups, industrial groups, rehab groups – any group that puts out back safety guidelines will say things like don't load the spine in flexion. Sure. Yeah. So if you build an exercise machine that loads or, or design a, a free weight exercise that loads the spine in flexion and you're insisting that even though the conventional safety wisdom says not to do that, you're insisting that there's a benefit to it. That's the controversial act, right. not applying the conventional safety guidelines to exercise. Got it. Yeah, I guess what I, I perhaps I misused controversial, but I just meant get, went against the grain in terms of the opinions within high intensity training about specifically the MedEx leg press. But and and, and that's fine. But but I've yet I, I haven't heard them explain how you justify reversing the curve in the lumbar spine. Yeah, is that? I mean, um, what, what is your understanding of the problem zone with the MedEx leg press? Is it that it doesn't it doesn't provide that curve in the seat? 
Well, I, again, I'm not I'm not familiar with it, so I'm not going to judge the Medic's okay. leg press. I'm just going to say that okay. the Nautilus Nitro leg press that builds the curves into the, uh, the builds the curves in the seat back. If you're interested in leg pressing heavily without jeopardizing your spine, that's the one to use. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I, I, I see your point. And I can't, I mean, it's been so long since I used the Medex leg press, I can't remember if it does build the curves into the seat. Um, but I think, you know, everything else about the machine is 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 probably going to tick the criteria that you've you've listed there as being, you know, what you would expect from a, a leg press machine. Um, but no, I also want to say, I mean, you know, we one thing I've kind of, realized lately uh, or, or formed an opinion on it. and i was having coffee with a friend about this recently is it's really easy to become like obsessed with nautilus and medex machines and just think that every other machine out there is crap and whilst that might be true in in that you know the the strength curves and the friction in some of these machines is really hard to um find in in other models you know, you can accomplish a lot with lots of the machines that are on the market and they might not be perfect, but there's a leg press, for instance, a leg press in um, this gym I was using the other day and the brand was, I think it was Pioneer or something like that. It began with P. And, you know, it was not Nautilus or Medex or anything like that. Um, and I would have to double check about the, the, the seat back having the curve, but, you know, everything else about it, it was very, very similar to the Nautilus Nitro leg press in terms of the way the feet plate moved. Um, and it felt great, you know. So I don't know what, what have you. What's your thoughts about you know, you know, people becoming so kind of no, you should only use these machines. Do you feel like that's quite short sighted, and that there are lots of other machines out there that you know will will be safe to use and deliver the same results? See, I, I generally, um, um, I would rather figure out. Like, for instance, I, I rarely will criticize a a design, no, let me rephrase it, a brand name, okay, right. because they all experiment with different designs and, and some are dogs and some are winners. Um, now, ideally, I would, I would look for certain features because those features lead to benefits, okay, but the other thing I would, I, I would want to do is I would want to figure out the workaround, so if somebody has access to X brand machines, even if they don't have what I consider to be the right features, I would rather figure out, okay, and here's how we're going to use this machine to bring it closer. So like I said, if you have a flat bench press, a flat leg press, with a, a leg press with a flat back that doesn't have the curve built into it, fine, we'll, we'll fit a towel in here, or, or we simply won't let your knees come back that far. Or if you have a chest press that doesn't have a range limiter, then I would try to find the visual cue that lets the the user know when to stop the descent and when to you know begin the positive of the rep. Um, it, it's particularly unhelpful to trash a, a brand name of machines. I agree because you know I've been, I've gone to some people's homes for sessions, and my first thought is, oh, you bought the wrong machine. But I'll never tell them that. I'll work with them to figure out how to use it safely. Um, because somebody, you know, someone somewhere paid a lot of money for the machines, and uh, um, and and none of them have. It's funny. I like to say none of them have the market on on. Um, the best designs for joint safety, but the Nautilus Nitro came pretty close. Um, but other other brands have other individual pieces that that match better, right? I mean, for a while, the Vogue and side raise machines was to be face down, and you were doing the side raise with your arms in in external rotation. Well, that was genius. That was perfect, and I don't believe I've seen one of those in 15 years. <laughs> um, um, I think Medex did, you know, like their design of the pullover where you have independent axes so that you're not coming back in that hard arc. Another, another good move. Um, but unfortunately, I think a lot of the manufacturers just throw features on the machine just to see what sells um, without matching it up against um, how the joints actually work. Yeah. 
Just um, reverting to back to leg press for a moment then. So um, just very curious, you know, I'll, I'll, again, I will link to that video where you demonstrate the, the nitro leg press. Um, your feet position in that are, you know, probably can't really describe it too well. It'd be better for the listeners to actually see it. But one thing I noticed is your toes are, you know, they're shoulder width, just maybe a yeah, shoulder width, maybe slightly narrow on the plate and your toes are slightly outward. Um, is mm. that deliberate? Do you have you got any thoughts about foot position on the the leg press? Well, and again, going back to the old seventies muscle magazines, where they would say if uh, you know, angle your feet completely out for the inner thigh and pigeon toes for the <laughs> outer thigh, and or or you know, turn your heels out in calf raises for one head and turn them in for another head. I don't think it really makes a difference there. I think you, you used just to position do all that. Your, in the seventies, yes, because that's what that's what that's what you know Frank Zane leg, and Arnold said to do. A leg day um, must have been fun for you back then. <laughs> oh yeah, 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 yeah. Sissy squats and all sorts of <laughs> silliness that I would never do now. But um, um, so I think you just find the foot position where your joints kind of flow. In other words, you can start with. You know, at the bottom of a leg press, you would like your knees to be wider than your hips, the so-called frog leg position. Mm -hmm. And then as they straighten out, they're going to come back into line. So you start with that as a, as a rough, you know, baseline. But then you got to go by your own individual, um, by your own individual joints. Um, um and in terms of height on a horizontal, so something like a nitro leg press, I'm guessing you want to create right angles with your with your knees. So that's kind of where you want the height of the foot to be on the plate. Is that correct? Uh, approximately, yeah. That's right. That's right. So somebody with, I'm I'm not that tall, so my feet tend to go a little lower on the foot plate. Mm -hmm. And you're right. I'm not looking at the feet position. I'm looking at. The, I'm more concerned with the knee position. Somebody like a six five, six seven guy, if he put his feet at the bottom of the foot plate, his knees would be really bent at an acute angle. Right. So, so yeah, you're right. You know, a lot of times we get concerned with where the feet should go or where the elbows should go, and really, it's what's happening at the knee or the shoulder. Right. That's yeah, really that important. Yeah, that's what made me realize when I was watching it. I was like, you know, all these all this time I've been obsessing with where to put my feet and. You know, like you mentioned just there, but really I should be looking at the alignment with the rest of my body. Like where are my knees at in relation to my feet and my hips? And, you know, so that's, that's a really good way to look at it. Well, see now, but once you figure that out, mm. the instruction has to be to something that the user can relate to. So when you're, when you're setting, when you, when you as a trainer set somebody up on the leg press machine, you're going to set them up based on what you just said because you can see where their knee angle is at. Yeah. But to tell the client, okay, the next time you use this machine, put your you have to tell them put your feet here because they don't have that angle. You got to, you got to give them a cue that right. they can relate to. Yeah. So it might be the feet or um, like you'll see on my chin-up machine, I have different colored tape for different grips. Um. So, so this way I can tell the person oh, put your red. pinkies <laughs> on the yellow tape or, oh, right. or you know, you know, I, I can, I can, you got to give them an instruction that they can relate to. Because if you say pronate your hands, they'll look at you like they'll you're They'll look crazy. at you like you have three heads, right. 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 Yeah, That's yeah. right. right. Um, you know, put your hands three inches apart. No, you got to tell them, put your hands on a yellow tape or put your hands <laughs> on the orange tape or, or whatever. And, that, and that's, if they get the, the person doing the exercise has to relate to what you're saying. Otherwise it's. It, you know, yeah, they don't know they, what you're talking about. That used to be what happened when people would say, you know, abductor humorous or whatever. I'd be looking at them exactly. like, what the exactly. hell are you on about? Um, exactly. <laughs> just, just on one of the things you said, um, something that I, I, I'm, I'm very much a visual person. So when someone describes something to me, I'm, you know, I really have to try to understand it, and quite often I have to look at a visual just to really kind of. Uh, you know, understand what they're saying. Um, and one of the things you said is about, you know, if your knees are kind of coming into your armpits, like on a, you know, one of the issues you mentioned, like a 45 degree or, or one of those leg presses where it's coming from directly above, um, you, the pelvis tilts. So you said it flips the pelvis. Can you talk about yeah. what that means? And, and also, can you just describe like why that's, that's a problem? 
All right, so so just get off the leg press a second. If you were to do a squ- a body weight squat, mm-hmm. okay, and you're you're watching in the mirror or you have your hand on your lower back, you're gonna go down to about about 90 degrees and you're still going to feel the cur- the lumbar curve is going to be towards your belly. And then as you lower your ass closer to the, to the ground, you're going to lose that lumbar curve. It's going to go away from your belly. Okay. As your, as your butt is touching the ground. So that crossover point between the lumbar curve being towards your belly, and then you go down so low that it flips the other way. That's what I mean. The pelvis flips. Right. Okay. I think I follow. So, so, and so, for instance, if you're, if you're just standing up, you can do a pelvic tilt, right? Um, you know, there's a anterior pelvic tilt and a posterior pelvic tilt that you can do consciously. All right, but if you're squatting or leg pressing too deep, you can't control it. The weight oh, yeah. is going to push you into one of those tilts. Um. And again, the problem with the pelvis tilting, it's not with the pelvis, it's not even where your knees are. The problem is that your lumbar curve that's supposed to be towards the belly, that where the disc pressure is even, it now reverses itself and the curve is away from the belly. And now the vertebrae are not putting even pressure on the discs. Right, okay, got it. Again, Sorry, gonna, probably yeah. not in an, an acute immediate injury, but over time, it's just more more wear and tear on the, on the discs and the structures in, in your spine. Yeah, which is why this is a really important conversation and interesting to me, uh, and I'm sure to many of the listeners, because we want to find ways to, or we want to make sure we're training in a way that's congruent with safety and longevity. Um, because anyone who listens to this knows that you have to do strength training forever, um, and no use doing stuff that's going to you know, manifest itself in a injury or issue later on in life. Um, so better, better to kind of identify that now and uh, reduce that risk. So that's why I love talking well, about this stuff. You know, mm. while we're, while I'm, I'm, while I'm pissing off the Arthur Jones and the medics fans, yeah, go for uh, <laughs> that's, um, you know, that's sort of the problem with relying on that stuff that was written in the seventies, because I don't think any of those guys writing it, thought 50 years later people were going to still the same people were still going to be working out i mean it just wasn't in their experience to have 50 and 60 year olds train like the 20 year old athletes they were training at the time mm. it was all the um, focus on around younger populations when they were doing demos and you know was it well, all, it was, but, it, yeah. but it was new it was new so whoever yeah. you were doing it with it was brand new there wasn't any time for wear and tear to, to accumulate um, you know, if you told Darden or Menser in 1977, by the way, 50 years from now, people are going to be doing exactly what you write right now. They'd probably look at you like you were crazy. You know, it was brand new at the time. It, you know, no one knew if it had staying power. Um, I, I remember asking at one of the, the rec conferences, a couple of the couple of the old guard, how has your training changed or has your training changed since, you know, 40 years ago? And they all said, absolutely. Yeah. You know, bodies change over time, joints change. And, yeah. and motivations, had, as, as you've talked about. Had, had, they, had they experienced injuries, like the long-term things, the kind of things we're talking about, you know, where it's manifested itself later in life and then had to change as a result? Had you had that conversation with any of them? Yeah, but it wasn't necessarily um I mean some some of us have had overt injuries mm-hmm. and some of us condition you know chronic conditions. Um um Richard Winnett, I mean when he um in 2002 I before Moment Arm Exercise came out, I did a a column for him sketching out Moment Arm Exercise and he published it, so I wrote another one. And uh, it didn't get published. And I, I asked him, I said, gee, what happened to that second article I wrote? And he goes, well, I ran it by some authorities and they said it, it didn't have any foundation. So I said, okay. And about 10 years later or so, he sends me an email that, oh, I've been, I've been, um, I've watched some of your videos and I've gone back and read some of your stuff. Do you have anything new coming out? 
I said, yes, matter of fact, I have congruent exercise coming out. I'll send you a copy. And I said, by the way, did you remember telling me that my work lacked foundation? And he said, yes, I do. And I said, so what happened? He goes, I hurt a lot less then. <laughs> so, you know, aches and pains accumulate. You know, when, when they, they get your attention is probably very individual, but, um, you know, goes with life experience. <laughs> Yeah, that's so fascinating. I, I I enjoyed talking to Richard. I had him on the podcast twice. Um, not not the best sound quality, but you know you just do the best you you can with what you have. And and perhaps we'll do another podcast and uh, maybe we'll work on that. But he's got a great um like pictorial on his website, which shows his progress over the decades, much like Clarence Bass. And mm-hmm. uh, that was really enlightening when Doug drew my attention to that. Doug McGuff, when he explained, you know, look how good Richard looked when he leaned out in that, you know, when he was younger, he was much more, he had a lot more body fat and he just kind of, he didn't really look very defined or, or as muscular. And then when he was a lot lighter in the future, he, uh, he actually looked a lot better and even potentially a bit bigger. Um, and uh, it's, it, I absolutely yeah. agree. Leaner looks better. Oh yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's probably healthier too. So, you know, not? you know, when we, when we would talk about, you know, what's the best routine for size or for this or for that. And, you know, I, I might be somewhat dismissive of that conversation because none of the exercise matters as much as getting your eating under control and being leaner. Yeah. Um, Get leaner, you're going to look a lot more muscular than if you look, you know, if you're looking thick. Um, so I, I just, guess it's a, cho- a choice. I'm just curious, you know, you talked a bit on this at the start about, you know, when you get to a certain age, it's about staying where you are is progress. Um, mm. Have you reviewed for yourself? Like, do you, I don't know whether you get scans done to see how your, you know, your muscle mass is, see where it's at. Are you holding on to what you've got? Or are you? Growing any new muscle, or where are you at, Bill, in your own journey on this? Um, I use a very scientific method of the mirror. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, the mirror and um, the belt buckle, the belt buckle technique of assessing my body fat. Sure. Uh, if I'm at the if I'm at the last hole of the belt, I'm fat. If I'm at the third or fourth hole in, I'm in good shape. So. It's it's entirely dependent on, um, it's entirely dependent on how sloppy I am eating wise, you know. Uh, sure. I um I th- I think I've retained. Well, like I said, I'll see. I'm going to get in as good a shape I can over the next couple of weeks, and we'll see where it, it is compared to eight years or so ago or earlier. Yeah. Do you tend to stay in pretty good shape all year round, or do you have a habit of like? you know, around Christmas time, like putting on a fair bit of weight, you know, how do you, how do you fare throughout the year? Uh, I might, I might swing, um, I might swing five or 10 pounds. Yeah. With, with around Christmas time probably being the worst. Yeah. Um, and that's fine though. I, I don't, you know, that's fine. I'd, I'd rather have a social life and a, you know, if I'm by, like for instance, if I if I'm eating a meal by myself, then I don't mind being very strict with it. If I'm in a social setting, I'm not going to be a prima donna. Um, <laughs> you know, I'd rather I'd rather enjoy the company or whatever rather than you know yeah. peel the skin off the chicken or whatever <laughs> whatever what <laughs> <laughs> whatever food fad is uh, current. I feel the same way. I, I have friends and admire them very much who stick to a diet and will never. Um, will never deviate even in a social situation or they'll eat before or whatever. Um, and I really admire those people because I don't think they're, they're not awkward about it. They're not the type of people who are like, you know, making it awkward for other people or don't, trying to be difficult. They're, they've just, in my mind, they've really just got their, their shit together. Um, and this is just their personal choice. Um, whereas myself, I'm very much like you. If I'm being, I go out for dinner or I'm meeting friends, you know, I'm, I'm probably going to go for something that's high in protein. Um, and it's probably going to be a, a animal based meal, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to be, you know, really strict and make sure that I'm not, you know, I'll, I will have a dessert or I will have, you know, I'll eat a f- fair amount if, if that's, you know, if that's what we're doing. So I don't, yeah, 
I'm like you in that respect. And that might change as, as time goes on. But the way I see it, and I know we've probably touched on this on previous podcasts, is as long as I'm eating really well, kind of 80% of the time, um, and really well for me, I mean, obviously that's different for each person, but and, and you know, it's finding what works for you. And for me, that's a you know, high protein, low carbohydrate diet. Um, you know, I find that I, I, I maintain a very good body composition doing it that way. You know, and then I might just well, relax know, on Saturday, or whatever. I um I I did some work with the uh, the Zone Diet guy Barry sure. Sears about yeah. twenty five years or so ago, and he said at the time he goes, you know, the real answer is probably everyone has a their own unique ratio of macronutrients that works best for them. He goes, and that's why different people swear by different diets, you know, because they've accidentally hit the ratio that's their ratio. Um, And I think there's something to that because I tend to be a little more, a little less, um, I mean, I'm not a vegetarian by any stretch of imagination, but it's definitely not a prominent part of my diet. Um, But I have clients, some clients do well with no carbs. Some people do well with, predominantly carbs uh you just got to find your you got to find what what works for you and that you can last with because otherwise you know if you're forcing it, it makes for a miserable experience and that's the key thing isn't it it's you know what can you sustain over the long term for you uh, mm-hmm. it's interesting you mentioned about I mentioned it. Um, I was reading some Mike Mensa the other day, and and I know that a lot of proponents of Mike um, will remember that he is was a high carb advocate, and he thought that mm-hmm. eating carbohydrates was really important. You know, if you're trying to maximize muscle mass, um, that's right. And and you know, I was reading that recently, and I'm thinking, you know, I I just don't think that's true anymore. You know, if you're getting or not true anymore, but if, if that is actually true, because if you're getting enough protein, you know, you're going to be getting glucose via gluconeogenesis obviously if you're getting enough fat you're going to be you're going to be getting energy through ketones so i'm I, yeah it's interesting how i guess a lot of people seem to be still very stuck on that and they're not as willing to question it and my opinion is that you know whilst yes it might give you the obviously everyone knows that if you're getting ready for a competition you will eat carbs before in order to retain more water and look larger right but day to day, I don't, I, well, maybe you're right. I mean, maybe it is individual and some people require more carbohydrate, right? And obviously it also depends on the context, the demands of your sport. You know, if you're in a crazy endurance athlete, um, then maybe, yeah, you want to do more carbohydrate, although you, you're getting some fat adapted people doing that too. So, you know, but yeah, I wonder whether it's yeah, a personal preference thing or, or not. Yeah, You know, the fat adapted thing is interesting because those muscle magazines of the 70s would talk about their pre-contest diet cutting the carbohydrates out and going into ketosis, but making a point that when the contest was over, you stop eating that way, which is fascinating because now you have people trying to live that way. Um, you know, I, I right. don't have a dog in a diet fight. I'm more concerned with, um, <laughs> I, 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 I really don't. I mean, I, I'm I, a pattern that works for me. And then if a client asks for help, a pattern that works for them, um, and you know, if people want to play dueling studies with this proves that 80% fat is better than 80% carbohydrate, oh, good. Sure. Enjoy. Enjoy. <laughs> my, my interest is in helping the individual find what works for them. Sure. Yeah, no, good point. And I know we've digressed away from uh, exercise for a moment there. Um, do you want to, if you've got time, should we just talk about the plank row for a moment? Yes, that was a video I put up. Um, I believe it's myself is there and uh, uh, one of the interns, Emily. So, so that um, you know, I know the CrossFitters and the TRX people think they invented it, where you're you're basically doing a um, you're lying back, holding onto the suspension device and pulling yourself up, as in as if you're doing a plank row, like you're you're holding a plank and and rowing yourself towards the um, towards the ceiling mm-hmm. and you're holding on to the device. But that exercise has been around. I mean, I have pictures of, of Arnold in the sixties doing, putting a broomstick between chairs and doing, you know, f- floor chin-ups or whatever they called them at the time. 
and I have other stuff. And I'm sure that the exercise existed before then because it was sort of like a, a go-to home, uh, go-to home exercise, sure. um, short of a chinning bar or some kind of rose. So um, I've got the Norlis Freedom Trainer, and so I put the pin in the bottom of the stack so that the stack wouldn't move, and I adjusted the handles so that you could lie under the on the floor, grab the handles, and pull yourself up towards towards the handles. But the problem was that even the the occasional young trainee I have. After a couple of reps, the full length of the body was so heavy that the form would break down and they would lose the plank or one shoulder would rise up or, or they would start to hunch over. It became more of a, a, a half-assed curl exercise. So the answer was to walk the person away from the, the support so that their body wasn't quite flat like parallel to the ground so that they were at with their arms extended they were at, at an angle and that does work but I had no way of calibrating it so I came up with this grid that I made out of 2 by 4s that I propped up against the machine and I numbered them so that at the furthest step out when you pull yourself up you're not quite vertical yet all right and as you straighten your arms, you go back to say about a 60 degree angle. And then every step you, as you got closer to the, to the machine, your body got more horizontal. And I found that even some of the 75 year olds could do like the first, second or third levels Mm. before they said, okay, that's, that's enough. I've worked out. And it's really, you know, it's really almost like a, a, um, it works in, in a lot of different ways. It's, a, it's one of the few ways of rowing that doesn't jeopardize your lower back. Um, because instead of being bent over, say, a barbell or a dumbbell, now you're, you're just holding a straight position okay, as you're do, doing the row. So you get the scapular retraction for the traps and the rows. You get the lats because... The exercise is hardest where the lats are strongest at the peak muscle torque for the lats. And you get some measure of, of core work because your, your hamstrings and your glutes and the muscles of your lower back are holding the plank. Um, but what, we, what I really liked about it is that instead of fumbling around trying to find the right position so the person could do a, a set of 10, say, or, or whatever – I could calibrate, okay, first step, second step, third step. Um, and this is going to make a lot more sense when people look at the video. I think you're doing um, a good job, though. I mean, I've seen the video, so I know obviously what you're talking about. <laughs> and, and what I literally did was I had all these elaborate plans drawn up with the angles and how much distance between the, the rungs. And, and I went to the hardware store, and I saw all the lumber I was going to have to buy and cut, and I said, oh, I've got to rethink this. And then I found the pre-cut lumber section. And so I threw my plans away and just used the pre-cut lumber and it worked just fine. So I made one version for the Freedom Trainer and then I made another version to use at home against the door, which is much smaller and uh, does use a knockoff TRX device. Um, that video I haven't put up, but that one I'll, I'll put up soon. Mm. So... Um, I know myself training at home, back work was always the dilemma, right? You could always do push-ups. You could always do body weight squats or dumbbell curls. But unless you had a chin-up bar, you know, safe back work was always always a trick. And um, this one, though, this one does, 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 does the job. And like I said, I think pretty safely, right? Being able to calibrate, it helps. And no, I, I think it's great. I think it's very cool invention and as emily said you've probably got a uh, potential business idea in that i think <laughs> oh she said i left that in the video son of a gun i uh, <laughs> oh i didn't I, I have no i have no intention of getting going down in that rabbit hole <laughs> yeah no i don't blame you i'll, I'll let stick, people stick if people to... want the plans i'll let them have the plans but now getting into ma- manufacturing and merchandising and stuff uh, nope 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 yeah it's a it's a tough tough game that for sure um so just a couple questions on that so I'm assuming that during just like any body weight row, you're keeping your glutes tight during the entire 
exercise. Mm, yes, like yes. And, well, that's place. part of the plank aspect of it, right? Is, is you're holding that your trunk steady or, yeah. or your posterior chain, you're holding that steady, right? Yeah. Um, again, if someone can't hold it steady, I would correct it one time. And if they, because maybe they just lost a train of thought. But if they if they really can't hold it steady, okay, the exercise is over. Time to you know do something else. Right. Okay. So you see that as an indicator that they are at fatigue and they could end up doing some harm to themselves if you didn't stop them at that point. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. that's as good a marker as any. Yeah. Okay. And um, I'm just curious. Do you think this is um, a sufficient exercise for the lower back as well? Well, see, I, I mean, we're know, going to go on to that, that anyway as the next. That's one, but... an interesting question. Um, it's sufficient in that you're practicing holding your posture. Okay, so while it might not help you lift a tree off the ground, in the course of your day, as you're doing whatever f- the physical parts of your day are, um, you do want to hold on to your, hold your posture when you're, you know. Again, whatever the physical parts of your day are, you do want to manage to hold your posture. So in the sense that you're using your upper body to pull while you're managing the posture, it's probably good practice. Um, More so than, say, a chest-supported row machine where your lower body is completely uninvolved. Uh, So is it sufficient for the lower back? Depending on what you want to do with your lower back, it probably is. Um, but of course, if you're if you're you know if your thing is powerlifting, for instance, then obviously no, you have to do some, you have to do specific, you, you know, you got yeah do um, um, the sports specific activity. Sure. So I'm curious, you know, let's move on to the lower back exercise. Unless you've got anything else to say about the plank row. I mean, I think you did no, a pretty no, no. good job we're, of describing this, it. This, this led in nicely. Yeah. So I remember, you. I know you've got a video on your YouTube where you demonstrate a, I believe it's a lower back exercise. Um, and it's like a uh, prone trunk extension, except on a fit ball. Yes, that's one yeah. of the congruent exercises, that's right. Yeah. So let's start there. Why, why did you decide to choose that for lower back? Um. Well, let's see. Um, actually, I'm not a tremendous fan of specific lower back exercise. Okay. And part of that is um, my own experience whenever I've done a barbell deadlift or barbell squats for an extended time, no matter how precise I, I wanted to be, at some point, I would pull something, quote, pull something in my back. Um, So I've always been a little bit reluctant to experiment too hard with that. And then in dealing with clients for 35 years, um, you know, I wouldn't be comfortable a person saying, well, I have some back pain. Um, And then saying, have you been to a doctor for it? Well, it's not that bad. And then giving them an exercise that, specifically targets the lower back because like I think I said earlier, something like if, if somebody reaches, if somebody reaches for something on the floor and then quote, their back goes out, they describe it as my back went out. Mm-hmm. But if you tell somebody lift this weight, it's going to make your lower back strong. And then their back goes out. They look at you. <laughs> you told me to do it. That's why my back hurts. Yeah. So I've been always been very reluctant to give specific weightlifting for people's quote lower back. Um, so my my approach, and again, part of this is is skewed towards the general age of the clients I'm dealing with and my own age. Um, I kind of rip off McGill's basic basic levels of of um, back care, which is basically. Um, some cardio activity just to improve the circulation, especially as a warm up. Um, some short range abdominal work, not necessarily heavy or, or quote, to failure, but more to mobilize or limber up the lower back. 
and then stretch the hamstrings and and hip muscles. Um, and part of it also is holding a good posture while you're doing weight training exercises. So when I have somebody on a leg press, uh, excuse me, let's say a chest press, their posture, how they're holding their lower back during the chest press is part of the exercise. And if they start arching or, or hunching over during the exercise and, and I correct them and no, you have to maintain the posture. Um, and that's where it goes, whether it's a machine exercise, a free weight exercise, a body weight exercise, you know, holding your posture while you're doing the exercise is part of it. Um, definitely slows people down a bit. They're not, they're not like zooming to the top of the weight stack, but I think it's a practical way of treating the lower back and, and, and preparing the lower back or the deep back technically preparing the deep back back for anything that might come up or most things that come up in their daily life. Okay, cool. So why, why then this specific exercise with the fit ball? Uh, well, yes, technically it was over. I, was it over a ball or a Bosu? I forget which. I'm pretty sure uh, it, it might have been the ball. Might have been the yeah. ball. Um, you know what? That was just to have something included for the lower back. So in that exercise, um, it starts with the knees bent and the hips bent and the spine draped over the ball. And then you straighten the knees, the hips, and the spine. And that becomes the exercise. Not overarching and not locking your knees and slouching over. Um, because what you're really doing is you're, you're holding you're, – the, the lumbar spine there, it does allow some movement, right? You just don't want it to move so much that it reverses the curve. Um, so this is a way of specifically addressing those muscles, but it's more of a control exercise than a, a, a strength exercise. Like I would never put a weight in their hands and have someone to do it. This is just so someone gets the idea of how to how to bring their body into the right posture. Um, um, and uh, I use the ball in that case. Uh, a BOSU is fine also because, again, there's something for your body to drape over. I realize it's not full range. I realize it's not the Medex lumbar extension, it's, nor is it the Cybex isokinetic back device. Um, but when dealing with people's backs, I'd rather err on the side of caution. And if they can do enough reps, enough reps that they feel the back muscles and they feel how to get in the right posture, um, I'm content with stopping it there. I don't have to try to have them set records using the lower back. Um, just because, again, given the age of most of the people I train, you know, this is not an elbow, whereas if something goes wrong in the curl, you hurt your elbow. If something goes wrong with their back, this is a, a major problem. So, so will you? So, if I've understood this correctly, um, am I right in thinking that you will rarely actually do a lower back exercise of a client? You will, because they'll be doing so many. Well, it's likely they'll be doing so many multi joint exercises that you know, the lower back is inevitably going to be involved anyway. If, if you're holding, if well, if you hold your posture while you're doing yes. the exercises, yeah. yes. And and I realize that's a big if. I mean, there are plenty. You see plenty of videos, not from me, of people doing, <laughs> of you know, curls and they're arching their back, or or they're squatting too low, or or they're using a kettlebell and you see them losing their back posture. Um, you have to coach it. And again, what I'm what I'm coaching is the back muscles holding the posture. Um, not necessarily trying to lift greater and greater weight with those same muscles. Yeah. And this is good because not everyone has access to a, a MedEx lumbar extension machine. So this is good to talk about, you know, people can relate to this if they don't have access to that. Um, what about things like, you know, a, a what, why not just a normal prone trunk extension without a BOSU or Fitball? Why not just, is it just because it's easier to do and uh, with that device? You mean face down on the floor? Yeah, and like a back? so. So I've I used to do Superman, you know, where you've yeah. got your hands out in front of you, and yeah. then you would, yeah. What's your view on that exercise? Um, not terrible. Okay, 
Sure. Per- personally, no, personally, I found when I got over enthusiastic and really arched to the the most I could, you know, the, the most extreme arch position, that every now and then it would go into spasm and then I'm lying on the floor gasping. Um but if you you know if you if you just hold back a little bit from arching is like for instance you don't want the facet joints in the spine to be what stops the motion. Mm. You know you don't you don't want to arch as far as humanly possible. You, your body allows that, but you don't want one bone being the hitting another bone to mark the end of the exercise. Yeah, makes so sense. So if you can do the Superman and moderate it a bit like give yourself a little bit of a well here's the thing though if you do enough repetitions those muscles are going to fatigue and it's going to moderate for you you're not going to come up as high um yeah you know um hyperextension is an interesting thing whether you should be doing it or whether it's harmful when we're talking about these types of exercises you know whether it's over a bosu a ball or just on the floor um, the fatigue in the muscles themselves will probably keep you from overarching to where it's going to cause a problem. Where hyperextension is really a problem is when you're uh, pressing or you're curling or you're bench pressing and your effort, your attention is elsewhere and your back arches to try to help you lift a bigger, a bigger weight. Right. That's when you lose control of the hyperextension. And again, it may not be a stabbing acute injury, but you may be putting pressure on your discs that's going to haunt you later. So, you know, the guy who's bench pressing on a machine or even on a bench and their back is arching to try to get that extra rep, or if they're overhead pressing and again, you know, their back is arching because they've hit failure, the deltoids are done. But they're insisting on continuing to push, and so you're, now your body is trying to to arch the, the weight up. That kind of hyperextension is, I think, a little more of a concern than when you're doing the hyper uh, back spine extension and you you go up too far, for instance. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, again, the, the second kind, the fatigue is going to take care of it, and you're kind of aware of what you're doing, right? So you have a built-in limiter. Yeah. Um, if you're trying to get 300 pounds off your throat and you're arching for dear life, now you're not paying attention to your back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a really good way of putting it. I ne- I'm embarrassed to say I've never really thought about it like that. Um, and I can completely see how if you're you're using some kind of load in a different exercise and hyperextending how that can be really risky. Um you know, I'm just curious on your thoughts on this. I did a podcast quite recently with James Fisher. And we were talking about his favorite exercises for all the different muscle groups. Um, And we were talking about the lower back and what he would do in a scenario where he wouldn't have access to a, you know, lumbar extension machine, um, which he does have a medics um, lumbar extension in in the university. And he was a fan of doing torso side bends with plates. Um, And, you know, obviously when you're doing a a standing side bend, you are using your your abdominal musculature, um, but his the way he described it to me was that you're using your is it your QL your quadratus lumbarum mm-hmm. or LQ I don't know if I got the right yeah, yeah. Um and, and that he felt that that would then in turn recruit um, you know lumbar extensors and multifidi and other muscles in that area uh, and would be a, a potentially an effective lower back exercise now I might not have quoted him perfectly there but that was his take um, what's your thoughts on that as an exercise again for I guess low back strength well you know it it, it, it is an interesting um, it is an it is an interesting approach because you know side planks are like the uh have been the uh fed core exercise for you know 20 years now sure. um and i've kind of thought myself yes yeah, side bends i mean if you don't like a side plank because of the pressure it puts on your shoulder or if it's simply by definition too hard for you why wouldn't you do a side bend um 
you know, as I'm flipping through my anatomy book here, yeah, the quadratus labor, lumborum would be one of the muscles that helps bring you vertical uh, as well as other muscles, multifidus, et cetera. Um, so I think it certainly is a component of – it's certainly a good way, interesting way to approach it. Um, you know, um, plus it's a manageable thing, right, because you can – it's a manageable exercise because you can look at yourself in the mirror and give yourself visual cues as to how far to how far to dip down. You know, like you wouldn't try to go to the floor with it. I I hope, but um, um, no, that's a that's a very interesting take and and probably a good one. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, like there- I said, you know, side planks are, are such a um a. a a go-to exercise when people write or, or talk about the core, but I'm not a fan, especially with the repaired shoulders. And, um, so the side bend, I think is a perfectly good, uh, and plus the side bend is a lot more progressible, right? Cause you can, how, whatever your increments of your dumbbells are, you can progress with. Whereas a side plank, if you can't do your body weight, you're out of luck. Yeah, yeah, good point. Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting exercise. I start well, I, I was doing it. I've started this new program which doesn't include it, but I'm, I'm certainly going to try uh, doing them and in, include them in the future. Um, and I found them to be very very challenging, but in a, in a good way. Like it, challenging in that. It just felt like it involved like pra- practically every muscle in your trunk, you know, uh, and so so quite. But but at the same time, you didn't feel. I, I didn't feel uncomfortable doing it. Like it felt quite congruent. I think is a word I'm looking for. It's still a word from your, you know, from you there. Yeah. <laughs> um, but 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 it, it it yeah, and it just was incredibly challenging to do. And and I I you know I yeah I didn't need a lot of load for it to be effective. Um, and you know I'm relatively strong at least for me. And so that was um, that was quite interesting. So yeah, I do encourage people to to give that one a go. Maybe we can find some some videos online to better demonstrate that. You know what's interesting about the side bend in Darden's early Nautilus books in the late seventies, he included the side bend as a latissimus exercise right. uh, in the in the lat section. And when you look at how the lats are attached, you know I kind of see what what he was thinking. You know because the lats attach the upper arm. Um, to the middle to lower part of the spine going down to your tailbone. So if I recall in those books, he had like the, the unloaded arm was on top of the person's head and the dumbbell was in the other hand. And so it was, it was to work the lats on the, the unloaded side. Um, and I think he's gotten away from it, but it, um, you know, it's certainly, it's certainly an interesting take. Um, you know, once you get into the core muscles, it's not quite as, as clear what does what as a pectoral or a, a biceps, for instance. Um, so there's a lot of ways to, 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 there's a lot of ways to affect it. And you just have to pick the one that gives you the right progression and allows you to start, or, um, um, allows you to start safely. You know, you wouldn't want to go right to a, a side plank or some, you know, some some gymnastic stunt to work your core because if you don't get it right, you're going to jeopardize your back. Yeah, yeah, I think that's great advice um, and a great point to end on in terms of, you know, some thoughts thoughts about how to pick exercises. Um, Bill, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, I want to talk before we wrap up. I do want to talk a little bit about what you've been up to and and certain uh, projects and things. Um, but before we do that, what's the best way for people to find out more about you? You know, lately, I think the LinkedIn is the best uh, place to connect. Um, that seems to have okay. a lot less, lot less, lot less clutter than Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> less drama. And less drama, less clutter, less <laughs> back and forth. But uh, it still seems to be a good place to, to get contact information and to, uh, you know, match up people with similar backgrounds. Um, I, I've actually been using that a lot with the interns as far as um, teaching them how to assemble a resume, uh, teaching them where the job opportunities are or 
uh, looking at people with say who are in their line who are in a line of work they're interested in but with maybe say 10 or 15 years experience so they can kind of see what those people did to get where they are and they can kind of get a, a path for themselves yeah i'm sure there'll be t- plenty of um people listening to the show owners of hit studios who would be very interested in taking on some of the interns you work with um, since they're beginning you know, tutelage from you. Uh, but I'm assuming you already have many, many connections and those, those uh, individuals will get first dibs. <laughs> two, two, two of them already have. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no names, but one in New York and one in Philadelphia. So, All right, okay. Um, I can guess yeah. though. I could guess. <laughs> sure, sure. I won't, no, I won't. Um, so... You know, you've um, so okay. Sorry, so we'll, so we'll put the the link to your LinkedIn there in the show notes. But w- w- is there any other ways that you want people to contact you? Website or? Oh uh, well, the the website is very generic, optimalexercisenj.com, and that's really for people who are, you know, people who are shopping and checking me out. So it's kind of static. I don't really update that too much. Um, um, I do update um, Facebook to a degree. Um, I'll be doing a, um, a Kickstarter relatively soon. Um, so I'm going to be a little more active on social media, um, uh, putting, putting material out to entice people to investigate the, um, the Kickstarter project. Um, and I'll be the usual, the usual suspects, LinkedIn, the Facebook, um, um, against my better judgment, Instagram, and um maybe possibly twitter but um um the other four places will 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 get i'm going to pretty much duplicate the information on all all those different places cool sounds good well i'll make sure i get all of those links and put them in the show notes so people can check that out and follow you via those different platforms do you want to just talk about this kickstarter project cuz it sounded really interesting and i wanted you to kind of hold your thoughts on it and save them to now because yeah, I, I think the listeners might be interested in what you've got going there. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Um, well, you know, I, I'd been working on this book joint friendly fitness for ever. Not really. Um, <laughs> but, um, and, and literally it's about 80% done. Um, and since I, I'm not sure that I will have much to say after that, I, I was – I had wanted to professionally produce it and promote it. Um, but I know, for instance, to, to do the full promotional package on Amazon is probably about $10,000. And – to produce the book so that I'm not sitting there trying to wrestle with the resolution of photographs and margins and page numbering and such. Um, you know, that was going to cost some to have a professional do it. So I had the idea to, to, to do a crowdfunding for it, but I couldn't get, I, I was procrastinating because it, it is, it was ultimately felt a little, little selfish, a little self-centered, even though I know that's kind of what Kickstarter is. Um, so I put that, on the back burner. And then when I started working with the interns and we were doing joint friendly fitness material and I realized I had some career advice to be able to give them and introductions to make, um, you know, one of the feedbacks I kept getting from people like the aforementioned studio owners was, gee, it's too bad you can't make any money off the internship. Um, so the idea came up that, gee, why don't I just roll this all into one project and the Joint Friendly Fitness Project becomes the internship and the book um, so that I can spend one-to-one time with the interns. Like a an internship where the person just observes is only so useful. But if it's – you know, if I'm spending hours training the people and letting them practice train on me – and breaking down information and making introductions, you know, that's a useful internship. So, um, so I became a little more comfortable with crowdfunding that as a project. And then the last piece of it was a newsletter because I thought, well, 
somebody who's interested in the joint friendly fitness material and thinks helping interns get jobs is worthwhile, they might participate. But if they're into both of those things, they might want to know on a regular basis what the interns are doing. So the idea of a newsletter came up. And so weekly for the length of the internship, I will basically some basically somebody who backs the project will be able to follow the materials the interns are following for the length of the internship. So that newsletter will have, again, what we went over specifically with the interns. It'll have new video as I as I re-video the congruent exercise stuff as way of teaching the interns. We'll record that. Um, the newsletter will be a preview of joint friendly fitness, um, preview pages of that. And then I'll probably get in the habit of doing an essay on whatever, whatever topic strikes my fancy <laughs> that week. <laughs> awesome. Um, so, so, so the, the joint friendly fitness project becomes more than just a book. It becomes the internship, the newsletter, and then the book becomes a permanent record of the internship and the newsletter. And, and that I said, okay, that's that, that I'm comfortable putting out. You know, that's yeah. this way the person who's backing it isn't just getting a, a, a coffee mug and a t shirt or a hat, you know, something, another piece to gather dust in their house. Um, you know, if they're into the, the final material, if they're, if they're into the postings I've done over the years, they would probably be interested in, in the newsletter. Um, and in seeing new people in the field get introduced to this material as opposed to trying to sort out Instagram for uh, <laughs> what they're going to do with their clients. Yeah, totally. I think this is a great idea. Uh, I'm interested in taking a look myself. Is the page up currently or is that soon? You said a couple of days. Did you? Cur- currently, no, but it'll definitely be within the next couple of weeks. Okay, so we'll, we'll definitely have the link. So when it's ready, just send the link over to me and I'll get it in the show notes so that people can can check that out and decide if they want to participate. But, you know, Bill, I think we've all been, there's plenty of us who have been waiting for your book and absolutely devour anything you put out there. Um, so I'm sure you won't struggle in finding people to, to support your cause. Um, you know, the Hill Fit guys are, are waiting desperately for <laughs> your work. So, uh, so um, I'm, I'm excited. I've been looking forward to your next book for a while. And I think... Because I remember you saying that you thought this was perhaps going to be your an even simpler version of congruent exercise, and, and obviously an evolution on that in terms of your how you look at certain exercises now. Um, with moment arm exercise being perhaps the more technical version. So for me, I was getting excited about the the simplicity that I might you know see, and I'd, I'd actually be able to understand it a little bit better. So, well, so. you know that that was um, that is that is a battle because yeah. And that, and that's where the interns came in handy because I had a I had to express things to them. Like for instance, if I talk to Adam Zickerman or Roger Schwab or or Fred Fornicola, guys around my age, um, with about my level of experience, there's a shorthand you take when you're talking about stuff because we know what we know what the other guy has read. We've all read the same stuff or or cross paths with similar people. Um, and then when you go to write, you end up writing to guys who have 40 years experience, which by definition, you lose everybody else. So working with the interns where I had to say, oh, wait a minute, this person, this person, you know, if I say Mike Mentor, this person looks it has no idea what I'm talking about. Um, yeah. You have to put yourself in somebody else's shoes who's not as experienced as you. That, that's, a, that's a huge help in expressing this stuff hopefully in a way that's useful to people. And also, I just thought we'd mention, um, you, not too long ago now, did your course with Hit Uni and Summer yes, Short Simon. Last, last uh, year, yeah. Last summer's yeah, project. On functional training, which uh, knowing you and knowing Simon and the quality of the stuff at Hit Uni, um, you know, I imagine it's a very good course. So did you want to like give an intro on that quickly? You know, f- first of all, the title was deliberately provocative. <laughs> um, but, but you know, there is some, it was deliberately provocative, but there is some useful material under the broad umbrella, so-called functional training. Um, 
the question is sorting out what's real and what's useful from what's a, a stunt. Um, and if you can take the what's real and what's useful, you can easily incorporate it in a 20 or 30 minute workout. And so if the person, if the client's getting stale or if the client has a specific weakness that one of these things can address, you can easily incorporate it into the, 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 the brief short workout framework. <laughs> um, yeah. But one of the things we did there and, and Simon and Joanna did a great job with the, with the video is um, for each exercise, I demonstrated quote wrong, like, like doing the exercise with a lot of instability um, and quote right with a lot of stability and what they did that's so great is they put it on a split screen. So, for oh, okay. instance, if, you, if, you, if, it, if, it's, if you see how to do the exercise wrong and then the next you see how to do the exercise right, you have to try to remember what wrong looked like in order to distinguish it from what right looked like. But what they did was they, they showed that and then they put them on a split screen so you could see the difference side by side. And, and that piece right there, to me, makes a huge a huge improvement in uh, making the material clear. So uh, we went through um, upper body, lower body core exercises. We went through um, explained about stabilization and how to spot it, how to coach it. We went through how to apply it. We went through some sample routines. I put Simon through a workout. Um, uh, and he also, um, he, I, I believe he still has, is offering a free PDF of Congruent Exercise Plus <laughs> to people who buy, the, uh, who buy the course. Okay, cool. I yeah. also think, and you might want to check with him, I think they were preparing some of those clips to put on Instagram because this way people could see what was in the course and not just have us tell them, you know, Instead of me telling people or him telling people how good the course is, by seeing an individual clip and seeing that side by side, seeing the difference between you know form discrepancy and good form, uh, I think that makes a huge difference in in the understanding. So, um, uh, you know, no cheesy Instagram videos for us. We just put real real material out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's awesome. I'll, I'll, I'll see if he's done that and. Uh... Again, link that up in the in the show notes. But yeah, and also if you use uh, those are saying if you use H I B ten, I believe, um, you'll get ten percent off any hit uni course. So that includes bills or any other course oh, that you good. might be interested in. So yeah, further further incentive there, and a uh, big supporter of um, obviously what you do and what Simon does. And hopefully, I can help make you guys uh, more successful, which would be which would be pretty cool. Um, you know, I think I said I think I said in in the introduction or something I wrote to Simon that, and this is this is just um, uh, confirmed by working with the interns yeah. that there is no um, there's no real formal source for learning how to train this way other than what Simon's doing. So yeah. <laughs> nailed it. The yeah. interns academically had no idea what normal style training was or, or even, you know, just tra training strictly, much less uh, high intensity. Uh, it's, you know, obviously elsewhere online, Instagram, YouTube, et cetera, there's just such an overwhelming amount of clutter that unless you're already into HIT, you can't find HIT material. Yeah. Um, and the print magazines, you know, forget, forget that. I mean, men's health, muscle and fitness, whatever that stuff is, that, you know... You'll never find um, deliberate slow training in those things. So, you know, Simon, Simon's material, that's, that's the place to go for it right now. He's, he's done such a good job. And he's very clever because, yes, you can find hit guidance in ebook form. You can find it. There are some good YouTube channels out there, some people that have been on the show, but nothing that's as detailed 
Mm. Um, and as comprehensive as Hit Uni. Um, and I think Simon and, and Joanna have been very clever because they've really dominated that category. So if you don't know if you're familiar with um, 22 Immutable Laws of Marketing, but you know one of, the, one of the laws in there is if you can be first into a category, and that can be a very niche category, um, and you do it very well, then that is a very powerful marketing uh, tactic because... There's nothing, there's no competition. And I really mm. don't think that I don't, I mean, I hear about, I know of, uh, you know, hit businesses, um, that have their own certification programs. But from what I understand, most of them don't provide them to the public. And I also hear about others who want to launch something. And I always say to them, you do realize that Hit Uni has something pretty amazing. Um, and unless you're going to use something very different, I think you might be wasting a bit of time there because I'm, I'm also not a big fan of i don't for instance for myself i don't like creating things that i think are already available because i don't think that's that helpful um unless you're creating something that's like mu- very much better not just incrementally better but like you know a big innovation on what already exists if that makes sense um, well that's why i don't so, regurgitate nautilus workout bulletin one well, or right. garden's <laughs> books when i write stuff Right, it's, it's, right. It's, it's already there. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, yeah. It's, it's already there. Why why should I repeat the same thing? I, I've got to introduce something new. That's why it takes me so long to write stuff. Because if I can't come up with a better way of expressing it or or come up with something unique, then why, you know, why? Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's a, it's a difficult, it's harder for you to market it and it's less useful. And yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it. Um, you know, I have a um, years ago in Manhattan, I saw a a beer advertisement, and it turned out it was for Grolsch beer. And I don't think they use this campaign anymore. But it, the 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 sign said mastery, not mimicry. All right. And I had that up in my studio just as a reminder, like you know, not to not to just reword other people's stuff, yeah. you know. Come up with something thorough that's unique. Um, you know, I'd rather be a master of of that and and really be able to get these points across than just rewrite somebody something else that already exists just for the sake of having something else on the market. Yeah, I mean, come to think of it, you followed this strategy perfectly. Um, and, you know, even for myself, like I get a lot of people say to me like, oh, you could create a course or an ebook or whatever. And, you know, you could obtain the permission of guests or, you know, create something based on what you've learned. And um, I just think to myself, my, I mean, some people might call this a limiting belief, but it's more of an ethical thing for me. It's if it already exists, like we've been talking about, if it's already like, you know, body by science, how can I possibly <laughs> create anything that even comes close? Um, you know, it's just, it's just a waste of effort. I, I'm much better off and better, you know, it's, it's much more valuable to others if I can create something new. And that's kind of what I did with the hit business membership is provide a, you know, a resource to help specifically the hit business owner grow their business, not just the generic health and fitness gym owner, you know, right, which was the, right. the impetus behind that. Um, but like, you know, I did a while ago, I did actually reach out to you and, and people on the podcast and ask permission to sell an ebook of transcripts, which I did do for a little while. Um, but, you know, I found it made more sense to just give that away. And uh, certainly these days it's difficult to, you know, most people give things like transcripts away. I think they're, you know, you could potentially justify selling something like that, but it's it's more useful to me as like a way of helping get people's email addresses as as an incentive for that. So right, because yeah. you're going to sell it one time, and then it's going to get copied and distributed <laughs> anyway. Yeah, right. So, well, so yeah. Uh, you know, that's like, um, you know, the helpful advice. Oh, why don't you put a DVD together? Why? Like especially uh, now, now the DVDs are you know everything is streaming. Thing is, though, you think you... that will hurt your sales, don't you? So I, I think I would challenge you on that. Because, for what instance, well, you think people will. This is this is interesting. To talk about this for a moment. I won't keep you too long, Bill, because I know we should probably wrap up. Um, but there seems to be a it seems to be quite a prevalent mindset in here, which is people are people don't want to. Um, create things like books and courses and things because they think that people will just copy them like you were going to say there 
and rip them off. Um, or like if it's, for instance, if you sell a, let's take example, like a PDF ebook, you created that, sold that for your website, someone could just take that and then, you know, make a load of copies and share them with their friends, right? Well, actually, I take that into consideration. So whenever I sell something as a P, whenever I put something out as a PDF and I don't usually sell it, the first page mm-hmm. is here's where you find other stuff I've done. <laughs> so I hope they're doing that. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I, exactly. Yeah. You know, if I, if I'm, if I'm yeah. giving away a PDF, the first page of it is where to find me for, for whatever consulting, training, other books. Um, because my, I, actually, I think my real objection is the, the upfront cost of generating say a DVD or a professionally produced book that you're not going to recoup. So I don't really have a problem with making congruent exercise available, for instance, as a reward for the Kickstarter as a PDF, because it's been selling for a while. It's out there. It's 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 run its course somewhat. Um, so I'm happy to use it to draw attention to new stuff. Exactly. Um, but the new but but the new book, frankly. It's going to be a while before I put that in an electronic form because it is going to involve a little bit more cost to to pay someone else to format it and get a photographer and manipulate the photos the right way, um, and even and, you know and even then, um, at some point, the book exists to establish your credentials, and it comes back to in training or speaking or or whatever. So, um, you, you definitely have to have a flexible mindset as to how far your ownership of this type of work goes. One thing I would definitely recommend you do, um, and this will be my only advice to you, <laughs> is uh, if you haven't already thought about this, is make sure that in your book you put your web domain that you want to send them to. You know, if it's mm. your, if it's your uh, you know, personal training website, um, and and try and capture email addresses of your readers, um, because it will just make your life so much easier over the long term when you launch anything new, because you'll start right, building right, an right. email subscription base. Um, and I know someone, uh, you know, my business coach has written a book, um, and he helps people, you know, build online businesses like like me, um, and his book. You know, whilst it's you know made him a fair amount of money, I don't think many people get rich selling books these days. Um, but it's been incredibly valuable as a lead gen thing for him. Mm. So for you, I think that would be really cool, It'd be really effective. Yeah, yeah, you have to take a little different attitude towards it. You know, it's not like thirty years ago where, you know, the book was the final product, and it right. had a sink or swim. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. So, and like you say, it can be very effective leverage for consulting and speaking and things like that. And that's how obviously a lot of these authors make a living now. Yeah. Yes. Without, without going the route of paying to be included in the type of book that manipulates exactly that, um, which I've had, I've, I've had a couple of clients yeah. say, Oh, here's my book. And I look at it and it's, I don't know, celebritypress.com or something. And it's, it's, you know, they have a name author and they oh, yeah. pay writers and they include these sub writers in the book and it finds the Amazon category with the, the least amount of competition and then it becomes an Amazon bestseller. And, you know, it's not a real book. <laughs> it's not a real content. It's a physical book, but it's not real content. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I have to put the blinders on. So I'm just putting out the content and I'll worry about all the extra stuff later. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, cool. Well, look, I'm excited and uh, keep us posted with how that goes. And, you know, when obviously when it's available and we'll make sure that the, the blog post is updated. Um, and maybe we'll do a, you know, a part two podcast to, to cover some of that, uh, you know, when the books launch, for instance. Um, and for everyone listening to find the blog post for this episode, please go to highintensitybusiness.com forward slash Bill A. Simone, all one word. Uh, that's Bill and then D-E Simone of an E on the end or Simon of an E on the end. And for all <laughs> episodes, please go to highintensitybusiness.com forward slash podcast. And until next time, thank you very much for listening. 
Discover how to achieve your health and fitness goals. Become a great personal trainer. And build a successful high-intensity training business. Check out highintensitybusiness.com. Highintensitybusiness.com.